Well, welcome again to session number four of our series on the great conflict between good and evil. Our official title is The Great Cosmic Controversy, How God Clears His Name from All False Charges. And before we have a review of our last session and enter some new territory, we do want to ask for the Lord to bless our season together. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege of gathering together with the assurance that your spirit and your angels will be with us. We ask, Lord, that you will give us clear minds and you will give us sensitive, open hearts so that we might understand and receive the seed of truth that you will plant today. I also ask that you will bless all of those who will be watching this programming through television and on DVDs and different media. I ask, Lord, that you will bring conviction to each heart. We thank you for the privilege of prayer and because we know that you have heard us, because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let's review what we studied last time. We studied the first step that Jesus takes in solving the great cosmic controversy between Christ and Satan. So I'm just going to mention the main points of what we studied in our last subject together. First of all, we mentioned that Jesus came to this earth with the express purpose of vindicating the character of God. We also noticed that according to the Bible, Jesus created every single person that lives upon this earth. And therefore, because Jesus created all, He is responsible for the existence of every single person that lives in this world. He's not responsible for their sin, but He is responsible for their existence because we did not choose to exist. Then we noticed also that the law of God requires absolute sinless perfection, absolute righteousness. And we noticed that if we do not render the law perfect righteousness, the law demands that the penalty of death be applied. Now, God had to be faithful to His word. If God did not require a perfect life in harmony with the law, and if God did not require death for those who do not offer perfection to the law, then God would have problems with His integrity. God would be lying. And so God had to require a perfect life, and He had to require the death of those who do not offer the law perfect righteousness. But the Bible tells us that no one on earth can offer the law what the law requires. No one on earth can offer the law sinless perfection or absolute righteousness. And so the result is that every single person in this world is on death row. Because we cannot offer the law sinless perfection, the law says you must die. And because all have sinned, all are subject to death. We also noticed last time that Satan tried to put a contradiction between two aspects of God's character. First of all, he tried to put a conflict with the justice of God, and secondly, with the love and mercy of God. Basically, what Satan said to God is this, if you do not punish the sinner with death, you're not just. Your justice demands the death of the sinner. But if you destroy the sinner, How is it that a God of love would destroy the creatures that He made? And so there was an apparent contradiction between the love and the justice of God. The human race needed someone that could solve this problem. Someone who could offer a perfect life to the law and could suffer the death that the law requires. Unfortunately, within the human race, there was no one who could live that perfect life or could pay the penalty of sin. And we noticed last time that if anyone was going to redeem the inheritance that was lost and free the individual from the slavery into which he had sold or she had sold herself, it was necessary for the Redeemer to be a next of kin. But the problem is that within within the human race, we had no next of kin that had not sold his inheritance or sold himself into slavery. So there was no one within the human race that could redeem 
the lost inheritance and could redeem those who had sold themselves into slavery. But God had a solution, and that solution was to send Jesus Christ. He who created every person in this world offered to come to this world to live the perfect life that the law requires, to offer the law perfect righteousness in place of every single person who has ever lived in the history of planet earth. And the Bible tells us that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt means pitched His tent among us. He came to live in the camp of the sanctuary where sinners live, to face the temptations that we suffer in the camp, but with one difference. Even though He was tempted in all things, the Bible says that He never sinned. He wove a robe of perfect righteousness that He could offer the law in place of every single human being who has ever lived in the history of planet earth. That's great news. So the first step was to offer the law what the law requires. The law requires absolute perfection, so Jesus said, I am going to live the life in place of all of my creatures, and I'm going to overcome temptation, and I am going to offer absolute sinless perfection, righteousness to the law. But this was not sufficient to solve the problem of sin. It wasn't enough for Jesus to live a perfect, sinless, righteous life in our place. Jesus also had to suffer death. You see, we had a double problem. First of all, we can't offer the law the perfection that the law requires. And secondly, because we cannot offer the perfection, the law says you must die. So Jesus not only had to live for us, He also had to what? He also had to die for us, bearing the sins of the whole world. Satan placed God in what appeared to be an unsolvable dilemma between a rock and a hard place. Basically he said to God, you told man that the wages of sin is death. If you don't execute the sentence of death like you said you would, you are a liar. And if you do execute the sentence, then you are not a God of love. A conflict apparently between the love of God and His justice. But God had the answer to this dilemma. God solved the seeming contradiction in God's character. You see, after Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life to offer the law of God in place of every single being who has ever lived, Jesus then took upon Himself all of the sins that have been committed, all the sins that are being committed, and all of the sins that are yet to be committed, Jesus took all of those upon Himself. In other words, the sins of the whole world were credited to Jesus, they were imputed to Jesus, they were placed in the account of Jesus, even though those sins were not His. They were imputed to them, they were credited to Him, even though they were not His. In this way, God showed His justice, because sin was punished, just like God said, with death. But God also showed His love because the death need not be suffered by the sinner, the death was suffered by a member of the Godhead. And so God solved the problem. He said, I'm going to satisfy the justice of the law because Jesus is going to bear the sins of the world and He is going to suffer the penalty. Just like I said, the wages of sin is death and He's going to suffer it in place of every single human being. But at the same time, I'm going to show my love because the sentence of death is not going to be executed upon the sinner, it will be executed upon a member of the Godhead, my beloved Son. So the Bible tells us that Jesus, after He lived His perfect life, Jesus became a vicarious sacrifice for us. In other words, He took the place of every single sinner who has ever lived in the history of planet earth. Let's notice several verses that we find in the Bible that present Jesus Christ as our substitute, the substitute for the sins of the whole world. We'll begin with Exodus chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6. Exodus chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6. 
We read verse 5 last night, but now we're going to read verse 6. It says there, speaking about the Passover lamb, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You remember we mentioned that represents the perfect life of Jesus, the fact that the lamb had no blemish. Then it continues saying, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall do what? Shall kill it at twilight. So what do you have there? You have the perfect life of Jesus because He's the blameless Lamb, but you also have the fact that the Lamb was what? Sacrificed. You have the life of Jesus, the blameless life of Jesus, and His what? And His death. Now I want us to notice also Leviticus 17 verse 11. This is a very interesting verse. You know, in the Old Testament, Israelites would bring the victims and those victims were, were sacrificed and placed upon the altar. But it really was not Israel that was bringing the victims. You're saying, what do you mean Israel wasn't bringing the victims? You see, the Bible says that God was going to provide the victim. Notice Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. It says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And here God is speaking. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. So who gave the sacrifice upon the altar? Was it the sinner or was it God? God says, I have given it to you. Even though the Israelite brought the victim to be slain and to be placed on the altar, that victim represented whom? Jesus Christ. So God says, I have provided the victim to be placed upon the altar. Now notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. For how many people did Jesus die? How many of the sins of the world did Jesus bear upon Himself? He bore the sins of the whole world. Every sin that has been committed, every sin that is being committed, every sin that will yet be committed, Jesus bore upon Himself on the cross. Notice 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And He Himself, that is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only. See, uh, John is saying, he's talking about believers. He says, He's the propitiation for our sins, that is for the sins of believers. But now notice, and not for ours only, but also for what? For the whole world. So the, the, the death of Jesus on the cross means that Jesus was the propitiation not only for the sins of those who have accepted Jesus, but for the sins of the whole world. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Once again it presents the two aspects of Jesus. His perfect life in the court and His death at the altar of sacrifice. Both things are mentioned in this verse. Notice once again 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For He, that is God the Father, made Him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin. What aspect does that describe of Jesus? His what? His perfect life, right? He's the blameless sacrifice. And so the first part of this verse says, For He, that is God the Father, made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin. Now what's the second aspect? To be sin for us. Are you catching the, the two points here? He lived a perfect life, and then the sins of the world were what? Were placed upon Him. Now why? Why did Jesus live a perfect life? Why did Jesus suffer death at the altar of sacrifice? The second half of the verse is beautiful. The second half of the verse says that, in other words, so that He did this, in other words, He did not sin, and He took sin upon Himself so that He could do something. That we might become, what? The righteousness of God in Him. He did this so that we could be recognized as being what? Righteous before God. Is it our own righteousness? No, it is the righteousness of Jesus in our place. So Jesus lived and died to be able to present His righteousness as if it were our righteousness. Notice Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 through 6. We're talking about the, the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The fact that He bore the sins of the whole world upon Himself. Isaiah 53 and verses 3 through 6. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, now notice the, the personal pronouns, surely he has borne, what? Our griefs and carried what? Our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by whom? Wow, smitten by God. Was he a sinner? No. Why was he smitten by God then? Let's continue reading. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord, notice this, the Lord, that is God the Father, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How much of the iniquity was laid upon Jesus? All of the iniquity of all human beings was laid upon Jesus Christ. It was not his, it was imputed to him. In other words, it was credited to his account even though it did not belong to him because he was suffering in place of human beings. Are you understanding the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ? Now, is sin going to be punished then? Is God going to keep his word? Is he going to punish sin with death? Yes, but who is going to suffer the penalty? Jesus is. Does God then show his love in that we don't have to suffer the penalty? Sure. Does he show his justice because sin really is punished? Yes. Absolutely. But the beauty is that Jesus does it in place of every single human being who has ever lived in the history of planet earth. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. This is another verse that describes the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, the vicarious sacrifice of Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 13. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now let's stop there for a moment. What has Christ redeemed us from? The from the curse of the law. Now you know what some people say? They say, see the law is bad because the law curses us. And so the solution is get rid of the law and it won't curse us anymore. Let me give you an illustration so we understand how ridiculous that argument is. You know, if you come to a stoplight, this is a brand new stoplight we have here at the corner. I don't know if you noticed that. You know, my tendency is to just to zip right through it because, you know, before there was no stoplight there. But, you know, that stoplight is there. Let's suppose that you're driving uh, 50 miles an hour and the light is red and you go through the red light and a policeman comes and he stops you and he's going to give you a ticket. Let me ask you, are you under the curse of the law? Oh, you better believe you're under the curse of the law. You're going to get a ticket. The law is going to curse you with a ticket, isn't it? So the best solution to the problem is to get rid of the stoplight. Does that make sense? Get rid of the law. No. The problem is not a law with the law. The problem is with the transgressor of the law. So what needs to be fixed is not the law. What needs to be fixed is the person who breaks the law. Are you with me? And so it says here, in Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us. Remember that word redeemed means to buy back by paying a price. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he redeem us from the curse of the law? Having become what? A curse for us. Why was Jesus cursed? Because he took our sins upon himself and he was punished by his Father for our sins. And so it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who what? Who hangs on a tree. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, 23 and 24. You say, Pastor, you're reading too many verses. Yes, praise the Lord. That's a good thing. Because we go here by what the Bible says. Because the Bible is our authority. The Bible has power. The preacher has absolutely no power. Unless the preacher is preaching from Scripture. Notice 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. Speaking about Jesus, who, when He was reviled, did not revile in return. When He suffered, He did not threaten, but committed Himself to Him who judges righteously, 
who himself, now listen carefully, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Did Jesus bear our sins on the tree? Yes. yes. It says, who, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Are you catching the picture? So, did Jesus suffer for the sins of the whole world? Yes. yes. Let's notice Romans chapter 5, and we will read verse 6, and then we will read verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, and then verse 8. It says here, and this is very interesting, verse 6 uh, reads in the following way. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the saints. Thank you. There's two of you that disagreed with me. <laughs> Notice what it says once again. For when we will still without strength, in due time, Christ died for whom? For the ungodly. Interesting. So did Jesus bear the sins of everyone, uh, of, of the ungodly? Yes. Now notice verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were, what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. Did Jesus die for sinners? who have not received Him as Savior and Lord? Yes, He did. He bore the sins of the whole world. Every sin that has been committed, every sin that is being committed, every sin that will be committed, He bore those sins on His body on the tree. The Bible makes that very, very clear. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. Here the Apostle Paul says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ, what? Died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So is the Bible very clear that Jesus bore the sins of the whole world upon Himself and suffered the penalty for the transgression of the law? Is the Bible clear that Jesus lived the perfect life that the law requires from us? Absolutely, the Bible is crystal clear on this point. Now, do you remember that yesterday we studied that Jesus is not only the unblemished victim, Jesus is also the unblemished priest. You remember we read some texts where it says that the priest could not have any blemish and that the victim could not have any blemish? Now you say, why in the world do you have a priest without blemish and you have a victim without blemish? I will explain it. You see, in the Old Testament system, you needed a priest and you needed a victim. But those two symbols are fulfilled in one person, in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the priest, the, the blameless priest, the unblemished priest, who offers himself as a victim. So he is the unblemished priest that offers himself as the unblemished victim. That's what we find in Scripture in Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. Go with me to Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. So Jesus is the priest, the blameless priest, that offers his, Himself as the sacrifice. It says there in Hebrews 7, 26 and 27, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests, that is the high priests of the Old Testament, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he what? When he offered up himself. So who is the priest? Jesus. Who is the victim? Jesus. Both had no blemish. Are you following me? Now, Let's read a statement that we find in the writings of Ellen White. This is a beautiful statement. Desire of Ages, page 753. If you still don't believe that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, listen to this statement. Desire of Ages, 753. Upon Christ, as our substitute, what is a substitute? Someone who takes our place. Upon Christ, our sub, as our substitute and surety, the word surety means he's a guarantee, right? Was laid the iniquity of us all. How much of the iniquity was laid upon him? Of us all. 
he was counted a transgressor. Was he a transgressor? No, he was counted or reckoned a transgressor because he was bearing our sins. That he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. And now listen to this. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The what? The sin of what? Every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. So did Jesus bear the sins of all of the descendants of Adam? Absolutely. Both those who will be saved and those who will be lost. Jesus bore their sins. And so you're saying, well, that means everybody's going to be saved. No, you need to come to our next lecture. Because we're going to study John 3.16. You know, people love the first half of the verse, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But the second half says that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what Jesus did in the camp and in the court is for everyone. But you have to claim it in order to benefit from it. Now let's take a look at the last three cries of Jesus on the cross. The last three cries of Jesus. You know, people speak about the seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross. You've heard about that? You know, during Holy Week in Latin America, they have an, an entire week of sermons, and each sermon studies one of the sayings of Jesus on the cross. Let's take a look at the last three cries of Jesus on the cross. The first is found in Matthew 27 and verse 46. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. Then after that we're going to read Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Notice Matthew 27 verse 46. This very short verse. My God, my God, why have you what? Why have you forsaken me? That is a uh, a cry of Jesus on the cross, it wasn't the last, it wasn't the next to last, it was the third before the last. Now, he says, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out to God. Incidentally, the last three sayings, he's crying out to God. The first four sayings, you know, he's not speaking only to God, he's also speaking to individuals that are at the foot of the cross, etc. But the last three statements of Jesus are directed at the Father. Now the question is, why did Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Notice Isaiah 59 and verse 2 gives us the reason why Jesus felt separated from His Father. It says in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. So what is it that led Jesus to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fact that his, He was separated from His Father because He was bearing what? Because He was bearing the sins of the world. The sins of the world separated Him from His own Father. And He felt forsaken by His Father. In fact, in Gethsemane, He begged His Father three times that if the cup of the Father's wrath, wrath could pass from Him, that it would be so. Nevertheless, he said, not my will be done, but yours. And the Bible tells us that in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated great drops of blood because of the anguish of feeling separated from his father. He was drinking the cup of the father's wrath. And on the cross, he felt forsaken by his father because sin separates from God. Let's notice the next to last cry of Jesus on the cross. It's found in John chapter 19 and verse 30, and remember that here he is speaking to his Father once again. It's very short, three words. It is finished. Now the question is, what was finished? <laughs> when Jesus says to his Father, it is finished, what did Jesus mean? I'll make, it, I'll make it simple for you, then I'll read a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. What he was saying is, Father, I have lived a perfect life and now I have paid the penalty for sin. I have finished making provision for salvation of every single human being on the planet. In other words, the provision for salvation is finished. It is complete. No one has to live a perfect life anymore. No one has to die for sin anymore. As long as they meet the conditions, they can be saved now because the provision is full and it is complete. Ellen White comments in Desire of Ages, page 834, when Jesus ascends to heaven and meets with His Father, something very interesting. I read, When upon the cross Jesus cried out, It is finished, 
he addressed the Father. The compact, that is the covenant, had been fully carried out. Now he declares, now he's in the presence of the Father, uh, he resurrected, went to heaven, and he's going to go to his Father to ask his Father if his sacrifice is sufficient. It says, now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O my God. I have completed the work of redemption. What did Jesus say to his Father? I have completed the work of redemption. And you say, how is it that Ellen White then says that Jesus went to heaven to complete the work that he began on earth? We're going to study that a little bit later because people say Ellen White talks out of both sides of her mouth. No, she doesn't talk out of both sides of her mouth. You just have to take what she says in context, when it is said and why it is said. But here it clearly says, Jesus says to his Father, I have completed the work of redemption, but he completed the work of redemption as a provision. But he has not applied the benefits of that provision to all of those who come to him. Are you with me or not? In that sense, he went to heaven to complete the work that he began on earth. And then uh, Jesus says to his Father, If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. I want to bring my people home. Is what I have done sufficient to bring my people home? I need to know whether it is. And the Father says to Jesus, it is enough. Someday you will be able to bring your people home. And then Jesus makes his last declaration from the cross. It's found in Luke 23 and verse 46. Jesus says to his Father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. What was Jesus saying when uh, he stated to his Father, into your hands I commend my spirit? What Jesus was saying is, Father, you said that if I fulfilled my part of the covenant, that even though I should die, that you were going to safeguard my life and I was going to resurrect. Jesus is saying to his Father, safeguard my life. Because you have promised that death is not the end, that you will return my spirit to me and I will resurrect. And so Jesus basically is saying, I've completed the provision for salvation. The benefits are available. My perfect life and my death for sin who has ever, for every sinner who has ever lived in the history of planet earth. And he commends his spirit to, into the safekeeping of his father. Now there was another piece of furniture in the, uh, in the court of the sanctuary. And that piece of furniture was found between the altar of sacrifice and the holy place in the tent. Go with me to Exodus chapter 40 and verse 7 that gives us the location of this piece of furniture in the sanctuary. Exodus chapter 40 and verse 7. This is known as the laver. It was a receptacle that had water in it, water for cleansing, water for washing. It says there in Exodus 40 verse 7, And you shall set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. So it's between the tent and the altar. You have the altar, then you have the laver with the water, and then you have the tent. And it continues saying, And put what? And put water into it. So the laver had water. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is walking through the sanctuary. Where does He begin His work? He begins it in the camp by living His perfect life, right? Then He moves where? To the altar where He's sacrificed. Then in, when He enters the holy place, He's going to begin His work as what? As intercessor. So let me ask you, what would the labor represent? Does the labor represent something between His death and when He goes into the holy place? It must be. Because chronologically, Jesus is going step by step. He lives his perfect life in the camp. He dies at the altar. At the laver, he must do something that takes place before he enters the holy place of the, at the, of the sanctuary upon his ascension. So you say, Pastor Bohr, what is represented by the laver, which comes after his death on the altar and before he appears before his Father when he ascends to heaven? Well, the bottom line is that the laver represents his resurrection from the dead. Let's notice Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. We're going to read this verse, then I'm going to make some comments about it. 
but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the what? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now notice the two key words. Regeneration, washing of regeneration, and then it says, and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to examine particularly the word regeneration that is used here. It is only used three times in the New Testament, the word regeneration. And basically it is a compound Greek word. In other words, it's composed of two Greek words. A preposition and a verb. In Greek it's very common for verbs to have uh, prepositional prefixes. Now the two words are palin, which means again, and the word, uh, and the word genesia, which means to live. So basically the word regeneration means to live what? To live again. So, and water is related to what? To living again in this verse. Now it's interesting to notice that this same word is used in two other places in the New Testament. But uh, let me mention those places for you. In the parallel passages in Mark 10 verse 30 and in Luke 18 verse 30, uh, it, it's not translated regeneration, it is translated the age to come. Now let me ask you, what is the dividing point between this age and the age to come? It is the resurrection. Let me prove it to you. Go with me to Luke 20 and verses 34 to 36. Luke 20 and verses 34 to 36. This is the uh, imaginary scenario of the seven spouses. Remember the seven spouses that died? Now notice what we find in Luke 20 verses 34 to 36. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of what? This age marry and are given in marriage. That's the time, the, the time that we live in, right? But those who are counted worthy to attain what? That age, that's the future age, right? And what is the next expression? And the what? The and the resurrection from the dead. What is it that divides this age from the next age? The resurrection. The resurrection. And remember, this is the same translation of uh, this is the same translation of the word that we just noticed, palingenesia. And so it says, but those who are accounted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they what? Nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, sons of the what? Sons of the resurrection. So what is represented by the labor or the water of regeneration? It has to do with what? It has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. So the labor represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you following me or not? In a few moments I'm going to give you additional evidence. Now a question that often comes up is this, who resurrected Jesus? You know, if you look at the Bible, sometimes it says that God the Father resurrected Jesus. In fact, most of the times it says God the Father resurrected Jesus. There's a few texts that say that the Holy Spirit resurrected Jesus. And then uh, there is one text that we're going to look at that gives the impression that Jesus resurrected Himself. So the question is, who resurrected Jesus? Well, let's take a look at John 10, 17 and 18, and let's read it carefully and let's read both verses completely. John chapter 10 and verses 17 and 18. It says there, Jesus is speaking, Therefore my Father loves me, because I what? Because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself, and now notice I have power. Now that's, that's not a good translation of the Greek word. I have power. There is a word for power in the New Testament. It's the word dunamis that we get the word dynamite from. This is not the word dunamis. This is the word exousia. It should be translated authority. So notice what it continues saying here in uh, John chapter, uh, 
chapter 10 and verse 17. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down my, of myself. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. Why did Jesus have authority to lay it down and take it up again? See, we've got to read the last little phrase of the verse. He says, what? This command I have received from the Father. So did the Father have to give authority Jesus to, come, to Jesus to come out of the grave through the life that was it within Jesus himself? Absolutely. The text tells us it does. Now, let me read you an amazing statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is in the Youth's Instructor, May 2, 1901. He who died for the sins of the world was to remain in the tomb for the allotted time. He was in that stony prison, prison house as a prisoner of divine justice. Jesus was in the tomb, what? A prisoner of what? Divine justice. Whose divine justice? The Father's divine justice. And he was responsible to the judge of the universe. Jesus was, ju was responsible to the judge of the universe because Jesus bore the sins of the world. And then she states, he was bearing the sins of the world and his father only could release him. So what happens? Jesus resurrects with the power that is within himself, but his father authorizes him to resurrect by the life that is within himself. In other words, if the father had not called Jesus from the tomb, there would have been no resurrection. Now, let me read you a statement about the resurrection of Christ, how it happened. It's found in the story of Jesus, written by Ellen White, page 155. It says, the, lay, the angel laid hold of the great stone at the mouth of the tomb and rolled it away as if it had been but a pebble. Just kind of pushed it aside. And now notice, then with a voice that caused the earth to tremble, he cried, Jesus, thou Son of God, come forth, thy Father calls thee. Do you remember the last words of Jesus on the cross? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He's saying, I commend my life into your hands. Does the Father call him out afterwards? Yes. Did the Father preserve his life or his spirit? Absolutely. Now she continues saying, then he who had earned the power over death and the grave came forth from the tomb. Above the rent sepulcher he proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. Powerful statement. And so who resurrected Jesus? It was by command of the Father that Jesus could take up his own life because the Father had given him authority to do so. It says so in John 10 and verse 18. Incidentally, do you know that the Jewish feasts follow the same order of the ministry of Jesus? First of all, we have the Passover. That's his death. Then we have unleavened bread. That's his burial. Then you have first fruits. That's his resurrection. And then you have the day of Pentecost. That's when he begins to officiate in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So the Hebrew feasts follow the order of the steps of Jesus in the plan of salvation. Now let's go back to the idea of the laver, the laver of regeneration, which represents the resurrection. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, did he leave every vestige of death behind? Did he totally cleanse himself from death? Notice Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 6 verses 9 and 10. You see, just like the, listen carefully, just as the priest would wash himself totally clean before he entered the holy place to do a work of intercession, Jesus had to wash himself from every vestige of sin before he could enter his service in the heavenly sanctuary in the holy place. When the priest offered the sacrifice, do you think that he was stained with blood, that he had the signs of death upon himself? Of course. So what did he have to do before he entered the holy place to minister in the holy place? He had to go to the labor and he had to wash off every sign or every vestige of death. He had to be totally cleansed from death 
and from signs of death. And you know, the Bible says that death, defi touching a dead body, uh, defiles, doesn't it? That's what the, the writings of Moses says. Now, notice once again, Romans 6, verses 9 and 10. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, what? Dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. So let me ask you, did Jesus totally leave death behind? Did He, so to speak, cleanse Himself from death when He resurrected from the dead to enter His next stage in the plan of salvation? Absolutely. So you'll notice then that Jesus is following the sequence of the sanctuary. He goes to the camp, lives His perfect life as the blameless Lamb. He goes to the altar, at the altar of sacrifice, He bears the sins of the worlds, and He suffers death. At the labor, He resurrects from the dead, totally cleanses Himself from every vestige of death. And in this way, He's totally clean to enter the next function of His ministry, which takes place in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, a question that I ask quite frequently, wherever I go, is whether Jesus forgave people's sins at the cross. And you know, I'm amazed at the answer I get in most Seventh-day Adventist churches. Not to say what non-Adventists would say. You know, whenever I ask, did Jesus forgive people's sins when He died on the cross, almost always the resounding answer is, yes, He forgave everybody's sins at the cross. But the fact is, folks, that Jesus did not forgive people's sins at the cross. You say, no, what do you mean? Listen, at the cross, Jesus made provision to forgive people's sins. He provided the means whereby sins could be forgiven, but He did not forgive people's sins at the cross. You say, now, what do you mean? Let me ask you, why, what is the importance of the resurrection of Jesus? Why did Jesus resurrect? Listen, folks, Jesus resurrected because He had another function to perform in the sanctuary. If Jesus simply had died and gone to the grave and He had stayed dead, there, all of us would be lost. We would still be in our sins because Jesus has to fulfill an additional function in the holy place of the sanctuary and He has to be alive to do it. And so He had to resurrect to be able now to go to heaven to give forgiveness to those who claim the benefits of the life and the death of Jesus. Now let's notice Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25. Very interesting verse. Speaking about Jesus, it says, Who was delivered, delivered up because of our offenses. That's another way of saying for our what? For our sins, right. So, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised, why? Was raised because of our justification. Other versions say that He was raised for our justification. So why, why was Jesus raised? So that He could what? So that He could justify us. And you say, now wait a minute, what is justification? Well, let me read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is found in the book Faith and Works, page 103. If you've never read that book, I would really recommend that you read that book. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, it's small, but it has a series of articles that Ellen White wrote in Signs of the Times and Review and Herald on righteousness by faith. And this is a short statement, but very significant, because we just read that Jesus was raised for our justification. In other words, He was raised so that He could justify us. Now, what is justification? Folks, it's simply a fancy theological word that means to receive pardon or forgiveness. When you are forgiven or when you are pardoned, at that moment you receive justification. Notice this statement. Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. Did you catch that? Pardon and justification are one and the same thing. So whenever you read the writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, which he wrote some things that are hard to be understood, according to his colleague Peter. So whenever you find the word justification, you know that it means what? It means pardon or forgiveness. So why was Jesus raised? He was raised so that we could be what? 
so that we could be forgiven. So did he forgive people at the cross? No, he forgives people after his what? After his resurrection. Now let me give you another text that clearly proves this. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we'll read verses 13 through 17. This is a powerful passage on the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 13 through 18. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. How important is the resurrection of Jesus? It's a matter of life and death. Notice what it continues saying in verse 15. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise, if He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. So in other words, why would he even bother to preach that Jesus resurrected? We'd be lying. So preaching would be futile. It would be worthless. Verse 16, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if, now here comes the key verse, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Did Jesus forgive people's sins at the cross? No. When do people receive forgiveness? It's after Jesus what? Resurrects, because it says, you know, if Jesus did not resurrect, you're still in your sins. So His death did not take care of individual sins. It made provision to forgive sin, but it did not in actuality forgive the sins of individuals. You say, why not? It's very simple. You know, all I have to do is read one verse. And we're going to study this in our, next in our next study. We're going to study about Jesus, our advocate, our intercessor, our mediator. See, that's the next stage in the ministry of Christ, in the heavenly sanctuary. If Jesus does not fulfill that next stage, everything is lost. Yes, Jesus would have lived a perfect life. Yeah, He would have died, you know, carrying the sins of the world, but there would be no forgiveness. Because it's in the holy place when Jesus takes His life and gives it to those who repent of sin, confess sin, and have faith in Jesus. It's when you receive Jesus as your Savior that Jesus takes His death, that He suffered for sin, and He places His death to your account so that you don't have to die eternally. Are you following me or not? But it must be claimed. You say, which verse is that? Just one verse that proves that forgiveness did not come at the cross. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, is that a conditional statement? Yes. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Forgive. To forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When does forgiveness come? At the cross or when I confess my sins? When I confess, when I confess them. So forgiveness is when I claim what Jesus did. The provision is complete. His life is enough to be in place of everyone's sinful life. And His death is sufficient to pay for the death of every single person. But unless we claim it, we will still be in our sins. Are you following me or not? And that's the next stage of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now what arguments were answered by the death of Jesus on the cross? Number one, God is no respecter of persons because He did not spare His own Son. See, the original argument was, oh, God has favorites. You know, He favors His Son above everybody else. But when He sent Him to die, He didn't even spare Him. Second, God proved true in His Word and just. It was proved that the wages of sin is death. Sin was punished. The justice of God was executed upon Jesus, our substitute but also the love of God was revealed. Because sinners need not suffer the penalty, Jesus suffered the penalty. If we accept Him, His death counts as if it were our death. So the Godhead takes death upon itself, thus showing God's love. Sin is punished, God's justice is satisfied, but at the same time He shows His love because He suffers the penalty instead of us having to suffer the penalty. 
Did Jesus show that it's possible to keep God's holy law? You better believe he did. He was tempted in all things, yet without sin. Did God show that he's not selfish? Oh, absolutely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the most precious thing in the universe. God is a giving God. God is a God who serves. It reminds me of the time that Jesus says, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. See, the devil had said, God is selfish. God is a respecter of persons. God cannot be just and save the sinner. God doesn't love because he has to punish the sinner with death. And the law can't be kept. All of these things were answered through the first two stages of the ministration of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Now, this still did not answer all of the questions of the heavenly beings of the universe or even the human beings on this earth. There were still things that needed to be clarified before the inhabitants of the universe. Jesus still needed to perform a work in the holy place and in the most holy place. And in the court when he brought the sins out of the sanctuary. Only when Jesus completed his, his total ministry in the sanctuary would the entire universe be clear on every aspect of the character of God. I want to end by reading from Desire of Ages 761. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. This is when Jesus died. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. And now comes the part of the statement that I consider the most important, and it'll set the stage for our study in our next lecture. He, that is man, must choose whom he will serve. So the next step has to do with human choice. The heavenly beings are going to see now who is going to benefit from what Jesus did by his life and by his death on the cross. The angels are going to see that it is possible for the sinner to be saved and for God to be righteous and true in loving and in all of his dealings with human beings. So the next step has to do with choice. When man chooses Jesus as Savior and Lord, there's a new revelation to the angels of heaven and to men concerning the character of God. So don't miss the next exciting episode of this series.